If you can just explain to us what cystitis is as a broad term first. Well, the, I mean, the medical definition of that would be an inflammation of the bladder. Uh, and then we need to decide on what's causing the inflammation. Classically, in, in the vast majority of patients we, that we see, is, it's ladies who have, who have bacterial infections which causes cystitis. And the, the classic symptoms they describe is frequency, passing urine more often than need to be, urgency, a desperate desire to pass water, and burning when they pass water. And that sometimes that can also be associated with hematuria, which is blood in the urine. So when you're testing for it, are there certain things, is, is bacteria always present? Or is it uh, to be able to diagnose somebody with a bacterial urinary tract infection or cystitis, ideally you need to send off a urine test and that, that generally that tends to need to be positive before you can have a diagnosis. It doesn't always have to be, but with a good history and a positive urine dipstick and a positive MSU, the diagnosis of a bacterial urinary tract infection, that's the one that we use. What's an MSU? Well, uh, midstream urine. Okay, okay. So, and what is it that makes interstitial cystitis different from bacterial as, well, as, as, a, as a name? Right, the thing is, with interstitial cystitis, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So patients will present with the classic symptoms of infection with frequency, rushing to the loo all the time, urgency, that desperate desire to go, burning passing water, some slight relief by passing water, but their symptoms will recur. And the, also, the issue with them is also get pain. And it's pain, what we call a supubic pain, which is just a low part of your tummy, just above the pubic bone, that ongoing discomfort. Um, and these sort of patients, if you look at the, the population, some of the studies suggest up to 6% of the female population, this is from America, suffer with some degree of painful bladder syndrome or interstitial cystitis. So, but because urine tract infections in women, with women are quite common in themselves, we don't really see it as pathological unless somebody's had a, at least three infections in a year. The vast majority of these patients are treated as a female UTI. So they'll be treated with antibiotics, which may improve symptoms in the short term, but their symptoms then recur. And that's the thing, the whole thing about interstitial cystitis is that these patients have chronic sim symptoms which wax and wane. But as time goes on, it gets more and more frequent and it has more and more of an effect on their quality of life. So is it something that's most often uh, diagnosed later in life? Absolutely. It's, it, well, again, looking at the, the, some of the studies, sometimes very young patients can be diagnosed with it. But the vast majority of patients are female, or 90% of patients that I see, female and they're usually over 40 but you do see it in patients who are younger than that as well so uh, i mean is that because it's a poorly understood com uh, condition is it possible that you know you, younger it, you know it could it be to do with the child wearing years and, and could it be that there are things that we don't understand that could well, reveal more for younger people well i think there's a lot we don't understand about i see that's mm -hmm. half the problem with it i mean it was initially described uh, over a hundred years ago, and lots of things have been looked into it, but even now, the underlying etiology, what causes it, what the, what the pathophysiology of it is, we don't really know that much. Hence, the diagnosis is a diagnosis of exclusion, so these poor patients have been to lots of different doctors before it twigs that this, this, this is what the diagnosis could be. And then if you look at the treatments, and we'll go on to the treatments in a little while, I'm sure, you know, a lot of the treatments don't really have that much evidence behind them. Um, so it's a diagnosis of exclusion, and the treatment is symptomatic treatment. It's not as if, unfortunately, if somebody's got a water infection, we give them antibiotics, they can get it better. It doesn't work like that. The whole idea is about managing your symptoms and get, getting on with your life with these symptoms. And quality of life is significantly major, affected. Yes. That's one of the major issues with patients. I think, as a, as a consulting urologist, uh, and I've got a special interest in ladies with uh, what we call. Uh, female low urinary tract dysfunction. So I see a lot of patients who've got females who've got urinary problems. And obviously I'm quite used to seeing these patients and when you get to take a history, you get a feel for what's been going on. So sometimes you have to take a bit of a panoramic view. And this isn't a criticism of my GP colleagues because they, they might see one patient like this every two or three weeks. But I see patients, a lot of patients like this. And you, when you take a history properly, take a proper history and sit down with the patient and go through what's been going on with them, go through them chronologically, then you can go on to the laboratory reports and see, well, actually, you were treated for infection, then you had no infection. So it's patients with symptom cystitis, uh, there's got quite a long history of it, but there's been no evidence of bacterial infection. And that starts ringing the alarm bells for you. And then when you tell a patient, you know, because sometimes they think they're going mad, because, you know, you go back to your doctor, the doctor says, well, you know, you haven't got water infection, don't give me antibiotics, but you've, you've still got the symptoms. 
Sometimes you say, look, I think, I've, I've done this so many times when I see patients in clinics. I say, Google interstitial cystitis and painful bladder syndrome. Have a read of it and tell me if, that's, if, that, if that relates to you. And sometimes, when, firstly, it makes them reassure them they haven't actually got anything wrong with them, serious wrong with them. And secondly, if you give somebody a diagnosis, say, look, we, we know what's going on with you. There are some potential treatments. It helps them quite a lot, actually. Yeah, so that thing about you know, going mad, we had uh, somebody contact us whose um, two doctors had said to her, it's all in your head. Yeah. So I think it's one of the, you know, when you, when you don't have an answer, when you don't have a diagnosis, yeah. it's difficult, and that comes into the quality of life aspect. Absolutely, and th the thing is, and I said to my patients, look, now I've given it a label and I've told you what it is. We haven't cured it, but you know, at least you know in your mind, the first is, you know, this is nothing life-threatening, and secondly, we can do something about it. But I also make patients appreciate once we have the first, once we've got down that diagnostic pathway and worked out firstly, there's nothing to worry about, and secondly, so this is what we think it is. I said to them, look, you need to manage this. And it's all about managing. That can be a blow. You've got to manage it for life. It can be, it can be, but then um, I think unfortunately that's sometimes something what people, something that people need to get to terms with. And then we, of course we can start on the therapeutic pathway. And presumably by that point you've ruled out cancer, which is a relief also. Right, the first, the, the patients we present with cystitis symptoms, frequency and urgency. And if the, the urine test doesn't show any infection, we need to make sure they haven't got the bladder tumour. So I investigate these patients by having a urine test. We sometimes do a urine cytology, look at the cells in the urine. And we'll do a, have a fellow look inside the bladder and do a cystoscopy. Okay. Now if that is all normal, now depending on the severity of the symptoms, I either try people with oral therapies, medications, or I do a cystoscopy and under anaesthetic and do a hydrodistension or a bladder stretch, which can be both diagnostic uh, and it can also be therapeutic. Diagnostically, what I'm looking at is the bladder capacity, because patients with classic IC, and unfortunately it's a whole myriad of symptoms, and endoscopically when you look inside their bladders, the signs can be quite myriad as well. They have a small capacity bladder, so when you put them to sleep and you start stretching their bladder, what happens is that the, 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 the nervous, their autonomic nervous system starts firing off, then their blood, then the temp, their pulse goes up and their blood pressure goes up at the end of the setting, and the anaesthetist will tell me. All these are pointers telling me about what's going on. They've got a small capacity. And when you stretch the bladder up, it doesn't hold as much, and when you empty it, it just looks horrible and red and angry. And the books will tell you patients sometimes have ulcers, because they're called Hunter's ulcers, but you very rarely see them. And sometimes in the early stages of the disease, patient cystoscopies are normal. So what is it that causes the pain? Very good question. <laughs> well, the theory is it's, it's, it's inflammation of the bladder lining, and that causes irritation of the nerves, which causes the pain. That's what the theory is. And what the treatments are to try and relax the bladder. So the treatments are about relaxing the bladder so it doesn't stretch too much, and painkillers, and giving people antidepressants, which have that effects on the bladder and on pain as well. So it's combined oral therapy in that case. Right, what I generally tend to prescribe is an antihistamine, um, because there's some uh, theories. So they're all theories, and what you do, you using is that... Why is that? Why are they theories? Because we don't, we don't really know what causes it. But and is it because there are not enough studies? There are lots of studies, but people have looked into it. The, the, the difficulty is with IC, because it's such a, it's a spectrum of symptoms, you know, if if you're going to do a study looking at people, what you have to have is people with something which is identical. If you're going to look at people who have their gallbladders out, you could get 100 people, take the gallbladders out in a certain way, say this operation makes it this better way than doing it. Because patients present with such different symptoms. Okay, uh, We do have ways of measuring their symptoms, use symptom scores. But even so, some patients get, uh, are improved by certain therapies, some patients aren't. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to, to stratify these patients and say this particular treatment will work. There have been lots of studies looking at all sorts of different medications to help patients. And what we as clinicians do, we'll, we'll look at the different studies. And we'll, we'll, what I tend to do is I'll use something which I know has got some evidence, and I'm hoping it won't do any harm as well. So is this one of the reasons why the, um, the, the Cobb Foundation um, has got some statistics saying that it can forty percent of cases it can take five years yeah, to diagnose. Well, that, that doesn't surprise me. And that's because As it's complicated to diagnose. It, it is complicated to diagnose, and with all due respect uh, uh, to my colleagues uh, who work in primary care, it's not something which is going to fly out at them unless you've got a specialist interest. 
Right, and that's because another complaint is that it just, some people turn up having had um, one round of antibiotics after another, after another, and after, and that's just not obvious to the GP. That's what. So that, that's how. That's that right, and we get, because unfortunately, it's all about continuity. And unfortunately, nowadays we don't always get continuity either. And they might be coming in with different that's sets it. of complaints. Exactly. Yeah, because if you go to a GP with pain, pain, pain on its own, and if you're a lady. Uh, of childbearing age, you know, they might be down the gynecological route and look for ovarian cysts or gynecological problems. Or sometimes people have pelvic pain and it might not necessarily, it might not just jump out at somebody that this is a problem. So it's not criticism because mm -hmm. it's, I say, I work in this field so I, I, it, the alarm ring, bells ring for me fairly soon on. Sometimes and I'll see somebody and they'll give me the history and I'll say, well, this is what you've got. So th once they arrive in a urology, you would hope that the diagnosis would happen reasonably quickly. I agree, you would expect so, but it's not always the case. Some patients have seen, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm as guilty as everybody else. It may be that I've seen a patient investigating for recurrent, investigating for recurrent UTIs, not found anything, and down the road, uh, a few years down the line, one of my colleagues has diagnosed them with IC. Be because it's not one day you've got IC and the, the next day you haven't. Oh, sorry, the other way One day you're fine, the next day you've got IC. It's something which is a gradual thing, mm -hmm. okay? And you see the patients whose bladders look normal, and then you go down the spectrum to the patients who are severely affected. You've got people whose bladders are, you know, they've got really horrible looking, small, contracted bladders, and, and they're severely symptomatic with it. So it's a spectrum of symptoms and a spectrum of signs as well. And for the patients, it's just miserable. They, they just <laughs> feel miserable and can't identify necessarily where their pain is, or? Generally down there, but you know, some people can articulate their pain much better than others, of course. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to what you said, so I interrupted you about the treatments right. um, you were saying. So what, I, do, I, what I generally thing. tend to do, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll do a hydrodistension, which to my mind is both diagnostic and it can be therapeutic, because the stretch of the bladder has been shown in some small studies to, in essence, it numbs the nerves, causes the neuropraxia, and that increases the bladder capacity and reduces the pain. Okay, so that can... That can help as well, so I'll see patients back, and then if the symptoms are fine, also, I've got a few patients who just come in every six months and I just stretch their bladder for them and it keeps them going. If it doesn't work, then um, firstly, you know, you, I think you, I'm very keen to get the, the help of my nurse specialists involved, you know, because we're the best in the world, they're, they're much better at spending time and talking to the patients than somebody like myself, because I'm much more sort of directed at what the problem is and dealing with how to, deal, how, how to fix it, but sometimes somebody just needs some, a bit of cognitive therapy. And I'll be the first one to say that's, uh, that's not my forte. So getting the pain team involved, if the pain is a major issue, that's something you want to do early on, okay? And uh, get the nurse specialist involved. If these patients are gonna be ones you expect at some stage to want to uh, have intravocycle treatment. So that's something you need to be thinking about. Getting self-help uh, uh, groups involved, telling them to go online, there are Facebook groups, all sorts of groups where patients can discuss their own problems. And then we can talk about treatments and I'll, try, I'll, start, I'll start with the tablets and I'll, say I'll start with medications which I don't think are going to cause them any harm, which is going to cause them some good. So it's, it's, an, it's hydroxyzine, which is an anti-histamine uh, medication, cymetidine, which is a medication which, which aids reflux, amitriptyline, which is an antidepressant, but I specifically say I'm not giving you this because you're depressed, I'm giving it because it's a painkiller and also because it helps on the bladder. But the third thing is that a lot of patients are up, and up at night quite a lot and it can help them sleep. And finally, I'll give patients a uh, medication to help relax their bladder so they hold a bit more. So these medications are all work in slightly different ways, but the idea is to try them all to see if it helps with the bladder function. And then find out which works for them. Yeah. Because it's a very personalised programme in the end. Mm -hmm. So w what would you, and because hospital procedures will differ across the country, what would you advise a patient to do if, for instance, they're kind of stuck at the primary care and in a lot of pain and not well, getting a referral. Well, patient, well, I'll be honest to admit, but I mean, doctors, in my experience, doctors will listen. If you say, look, I've got these symptoms and I've read around it, and I'm, because uh, I've seen patients refer to me like this, and GP letter will say, look, you know, this patient's got these symptoms, they're worried they've got IC, please see them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing, you're entirely within your rights to tell the GP the concerns that you've got and ask to be referred. And the GP colleagues that I'm with, I don't think any of them will have any issues in referring you. They'll obviously do the standard things. They'll check your urine and make sure you haven't got an infection uh, and, and do all the other standard stuff before they refer you over because that will be the expectation from me. Mm -hmm. and, and from the patient. Absolutely. Okay. So 
But it's it's okay to ask for. No, for there's help no problem. That. Sometimes I that's, that can be hard. They just do what they're told rather well, than. Some patients do, and mm -hmm. we, we as doctors like patients to do that. <laughs> but we also like patients to question us as well. So like that. to me, it's a two-way thing. You know, the, there's a tacit, unwritten agreement between a patient and a doctor. When, and I've said this to many of my patients. The agree, the, the, from the patient's side of view is, when a patient comes to see me, what they're telling me, I assume to be the truth. So they're not making their symptoms up, and why would they? So you're never going to say it's all in your head. Well, no, that's, that's, my, that, that's how I look at it. So it's a two-way thing. So I'm assuming what the patient is telling me is the truth. You're, you're telling me about your problem. Because if you've got pain, I can't always say, look, you can't always do a test for pain. So that's the patient side of the bargain. My side of the bargain is that I will believe what they say and I will do the appropriate tests and I'll do what I think is best for them without, without, without trying not to cause them any harm. And that's what I feel is the sort of interaction which happens between a doctor and a patient every time I see a new patient. Mm -hmm. And indeed throughout the course of the treatment because well, do, do some things stop working after a while? Yeah, well, in some patients, you, and it's very gratifying, you can see some patients and you know, the medication will work and they're happy. Okay, and if some patients are doing the medications don't work, then you go to the next stage. Okay, uh, so you might have some patients who's treated with tablets and their quality of life is better. They can cope. They can do what they need to do. I say at the beginning we said, look, this is something you have to live with. We can't cure it. Okay, then you've got the next set of patients who think those don't work, and then you decide what you're going to do with them. Okay, and I said we've already got them seeing the, uh, the pain team. They're having you know, cognitive therapy. They're having uh, seeing our nurse specialists. And then we go into the cycle treatments, which is where GEPAM comes in, of course. And that cohort of patients, a significant proportion of them get better. Okay? And if they're young, well-motivated patients who can uh, catheterise themselves, then I discharge them off into the community. They, once they've had their induction treatment and they're on to maintenance, their symptoms are fine. Off they go, they have the treatment once every month, once every six weeks, whichever suits them. And what we've done now is we organise with the GP practice, and they're really happy. Because as far as the funding concerned is now, it goes back to GPs. The cost of a drug is sorted out. The patient self catheterised. They don't have to come in hospital. A lot of these people are young people who've got jobs. They don't want to take, you know, once a month have to come into hospital, miss a morning or an afternoon at work. You know, if they, they can control again. It's all giving them the control. Yeah. They've got control over their bladders again. And that's important in terms of quality of life as well. It's feeling yeah. in control of their life. Absolutely. Um, you need to get a bus that takes two hours to get to a hospital for an appointment. You wait. And Absolutely, you know, absolutely, and uh, if you're on the other side, you appreciate that you, you, you when, when you're a patient, and this happened to me with relatives, that you don't have to control anymore, you just got to join everybody else and sit down and wait your turn, which unfortunately is the system that we work in, and that's a different story, to get. that's a different conversation. So those patients who once have had their cycle treatment and in whom it works, fantastic, there are those patients in whom it doesn't work, of course, then what you can try is a combination of the oral therapies and the intravascular treatment. And if it doesn't work on them, then we're running, getting into trouble, really. Uh, there are patients who, on whom I treat with Botox. Um, that will treat more of the pain symptoms rather than the frequency. But again, it will give patients relief. Uh, and there are a very small cohort of patients whose life really is taken over by their bladder problems. You can refer them for secondary modulation, but I've had a few. Well, yeah, basically, you have a little wire inserted into your spine, you have a little pacemaker inserted, and that stimulates the bladder and helps relax it. And it can, it's similar to a TENS machine, but it's actually within the spine of the cell. So, so you can try the neuromodulation, which doesn't really work that well, to be honest, I suppose. Uh, and then ultimately, if things are severe, some people end up having their bladders removed completely. That's drastic. That's a major operation. What percentage is that? It's pretty rare. Mm. It's much less than 1%. Right. Yeah, it's very rare. So that, that those are the patients who've got these tiny, contracted, severely abnormal-looking bladders as well. That's the sort of patients you're looking at. So in a sense, that seems um, one of the things that's easily lost is hope. But that sounds to me as actually there is quite a lot of hope. What there, there is a there's a there's a there's a diagnostic pathway and a treatment pathway. Okay, so there are lots of things potentially we can offer them. Um, but I say the, I think the opening consultation you have with somebody when you tell them what your diagnosis is and tell them it's a journey, you know, there's no magic tablet, okay. I'm afraid. And does that mean that there would be a value or no value in having a national guideline for this? The thing with guidelines is they are guidelines, okay. And when patients come to me, you know, quoting me guidelines, they say, look, it's a guideline, and it doesn't necessarily always apply to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. In particular, I mean, I don't know if all like this, but it sounds like this is particularly personalised. It is. I mean, the, the, 
in America they've got the NIDTK. Uh, I can't remember what it means. Stands for, but it's called the NID, and they've and they've tried to classify uh, IC, give it a diagnostic classification, and the American Neurological Association have tried to give us an algorithm how to treat patients. But all along the way, it says it has to be point personalised, and it's got to be treatment towards a particular patient. It's very difficult because the patients said present with a myriad of symptoms. They don't always have the same symptoms. And uh, when we look inside the blood, it's always not the same. So it depends really on whether the pain is more of an issue, mm -hmm. is it frequency is more of an issue, is it the, the cystitis, the burning more of an issue, and then you've got a te temporary treatments depending on what the patient's tell. So does that mean that throughout the country people are trying different things and you're talking to each other as urologists to share information in the way that we would hope that patients would also talk to each oh, well, other? You know, of course there are meetings that we have, in the national meetings, international meetings, where we look into research and what people treat, generally people are doing as far as treatments are concerned. Then you've got uh, colleagues of mine who have a specialist interest, and we, you know, so we sometimes have forums where we get together. It is a little bit of a Cinderella thing, it's just a status, because so it's not like you can do a wonder. We as doctors, you know, we like to cure patients and say that's it, but it's not, you, we haven't got the magic tablet, we haven't got the magic operation. Do you think it will come? Honestly, it's been over 150 years, mm. probably not in my lifetime. But more research, more shared information, more understanding? Well, where well, there's life, there's hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what do you know about that's coming that might help? Are there new treatments coming? Well, they've been talking about uh, all sorts of... Because I think it's an, an, an anti-inflammatory. It's an inflammatory process, talking about medications which can reduce inflammation. They've used things like cyclosporin over the years. And there are auto, autoimmune sort of medications. So I can't remember the names of it, but there are... They're, they're looking at it more in that sort of way, but the problem with these, much, they're much more invasive medications than the side, of, the side effects. You're looking at people giving people immunoglobulins and things like that. Uh, but a lot of the study at the moment is bench-based. It's not really been used on patients. But that's still at least they're looking into it. Well, yeah, it's something that's been always been something which can be looked into. Because there's uh, one uh, person that we spoke to that her, has two daughters. Does it run in families? But I mean, she's worried for her daughters, but she's hopeful that something well, will emerge as a cure we for do, them. We do not think it's got a genetic basis. We don't think it's. We think it's. It, we think it's idiopathic. I'm not aware of any. I just think they've been very unlucky. I'm not mm. aware of any family link, genetic link reason why it should happen. That is unlucky. Yeah. Well, uh, here's hoping there is some um, developments. And um, is there anything? Is there you know? Are there any places that you would recommend that people can go looking for help? <laughs> Come to press. No, well, I think at the end of the day, I think we're all very savvy with the internet now, uh, and most departments in the country uh, have doctors like myself who have a degree of interest in this certain treat and treating patients with this sort of problem. So, I mean, there are people who are recognised experts throughout the country, um, but I think most urology departments. And gynaecologists, to be fair, urogynaecologists as well, who deal with the old ladies with bladder problems. You know, they, they do have a degree of specialist interest in it. And it's like a pyramid. You start off with the GPs, and you might see urologists who's not got that much of interest, and then, then they, they might refer to somebody else. So there's that sort of system that works as well. So really, the more informed the patient can become, the, the, the more that might help you, and the more savvy they are about their own. Does that relate to me? Yes, no. Yeah. Then the conversation. Uh, absolutely right. And I say, well, when I first see a patient, when I think they've got IC, the first thing I say is look on the website, see if that applies to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much.